Um, uh, Dr. Timpley is a chief of cardiology at the Northampton General Hospital and um, is also a very active member of um, uh, Pace for Life. Uh, we have been with him. He has taught us. I was, I've been with him in the uh, Northampton. I've learned a lot of techniques from him. And he has also come to Nigeria to teach a lot of us uh, so many techniques. We are really, really privileged uh, to have him talk to us today on uh, cardiac uh, risk signalization therapy and the management of complications that may arise from any of such uh, a procedure. So we are grateful to have you, Dr. Jonathan Timpley, uh, being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure being in Nigeria and also having Dr. Duffy come over to the UK. And so just a little bit, um, this presentation will include, I will give you a warning, uh, some military aircraft. Uh, I spent 20 years in the Royal Air Force and I cannot have a presentation without some military aircraft. So please excuse me when they do appear. Uh, it is a form of therapy for me um, and I hope you enjoy. Yes. So what we're going to look at, and this is really just going a bit to the background of what is CRT? How does it work? And then we'll look through the technique of, of some of the techniques of doing it. And then one of the complications that can occur, we've got a few slides on um, dissection, because I know when we were uh, out in Nigeria, we had a, a dissection over in Lagos. Uh, and so just a, a, a couple of video clips showing what we can do uh, and, and then a discussion on, on how dissection occurs and, and what we can do to try and avoid it. So we'll go back to some of the pathophysiology and some of the original studies, um, because I think it is important for us to realise where we've come from. Um, we'll look at the brief, I'm not really going to go too much into the current indications because we, we know about that, but we'll more be looking at the technical aspects of implantation. Uh, and as I've mentioned, you've got to have some past and present aircraft of the Royal Air Force uh, in all presentations. Now, heart failure is a big problem. This is UK data, 11,500 annual deaths from heart failure, and up to 40% of those will die within the first year of diagnosis. And when we look at where the money is spent on these people, 60% is spent on in-hospital care. So we've got a therapy in terms of CRT that has been shown to, as well as improving mortality, as well as reducing symptoms, it also reduces hospitalization and when you've got limited resources such as the nhs does in the same way as in, and obviously differently in nigeria but we have limits on our resources then if we can do something that is going to reduce hospital admissions that is a good thing and when we look at what happens with these people with heart failure in the general heart failure po population we see that about 15 percent of people will have either inter or intraventricular conduction delays but when we go to the moderate to severe group, so those generally with the NYJ class two to four, then the presence of that intraventricular, usually intraventricular conduction delay is about 30%. So we know is as people move from uh, mild to significant heart failure, there is a worsening of their conduction. And this study was, the Vesnarinone study was a, a, a study into an agent treat, uh, that was trials for looking at prevention of uh, people requiring transplantation. Uh, what it did show that um, vesnarinone um, actually killed people, so they stopped using it. But what they did have was a lot of data on um, people with heart failure, and they were unable to then look at what were the risk factors for death in these people with significant heart failure. And unsurprisingly, they found out age was one, worsening renal function, worsening left ventricular ejection fraction, an increasing heart rate. And they also found a very beautiful correlation between the cure duration and mortality. And what they found within one year, with those of those with a narrow QRS, they were finding up to a 10% mortality. But in those with the broadest QRS is over 220 milliseconds, then they were getting up to a 40% mortality. So as your QRS gets broader, your risk of death goes up. But in terms of symptoms, um, it's not quite as straightforward. So when we look at people who have MYHA class two with heart failure, and we're talking about people with the same ejection fraction. So if you just consider anyone with ejection fraction of 30 percent, then what we find is that two thirds of those people, which is the pale uh, blue block, um, will die from sudden cardiac death. 
but your mode of death changes as you get worsening symptomatology and get into MIHA class four, when actually only one third of those people will die a sudden cardiac death. The majority of those people in MIJ class four, actually progressive pump failure is the cause for their death. So having people with relatively modest symptoms, they are the people who tend unfortunately to drop down dead from ventricular arrhythmias. And that's important obviously for the ICD selection as well as those for um, a CRT. And that it, obviously in New, New York Heart Association class four is a contraindication to putting an ICD. And that makes sense because you're not doing just with an ICD component, you're not doing anything to um, improve LV function and, and to improve pump function. All you're trying to do is stop sudden cardiac death, but the majority don't die from that. So, and what we're interested in, and hopefully this is, is that playing okay, Julius? Not if it is, yep, good. Um, we're looking at people who've got hearts like this. And here's a beautiful example. You could look at that lateral wall in on this four chamber view on its own and say, that's not bad left ventricular function just on the lateral wall. But when you take into account what's happening in the intraventricular septum, this has got a calculated ejection fraction of 4% because all of that blood is being sloshed from left to right. When you look at the mitral valve, it's really not really opening up because of the, much because of high left ventricular end diastolic pressures. So that's what we've got, and that's what we want to be treating. And so the elements of cardiac dyssynchrony, we have AV dyssynchrony, uh, we have interventricular dyssynchrony, but really the area we're looking at with CRT is the intraventricular dyssynchrony. And there are lots of different ways of measuring this, but actually, and ultimately, the ECG still remains the primary determinant of whether we should consider CRT therapy. Uh, we can use you know, M mode parameters, we can use speckle tracking, uh, we can use TDI, uh, but actually, uh, that, I mean, they're useful, especially as a research tool, but actually the ECG remains a prime tool for assessing people for um, CRT. Now, what are the deleterious effects of dyssynchrony on cardiac function? Well, as we saw in that first example, and here's another one, when you have a dyssynchronous left ventricle, you get a lot of sloshing of blood, which increases, uh, and with the associated increase in end systolic volume, because you haven't ejected the blood, then you get increased wall stress. You can get post systolic th thickening, which has no impact on the ejection fraction because the aortic valve is closed. You get mechanoenergetic inefficiency, um, and you can also get mitral valve dysfunction, such that you can end up with pre systolic mitral regurgitation. So you've actually worsened your ejection fraction before you've even started. So all of these components really impair the left ventricular function. And we do worry about the AV delay, but actually the majority of people who've got an AV delay that runs between 50 and 130 milliseconds actually are probably in a, a relatively optimal position. As you get really long AV delays, then yes, we can impair left ventricular filling, but the AV delay, yes, we can optimize it, but actually what we really need is the left ventricular pacing component. And that is a beautiful picture of a Canberra PR9 uh, from RF Marum 39 Squadron. I looked after these guys back in the 90s. Um, and at altitude, that aircraft is better than the U2. Sorry, AJ. Um, and actually, the Americans then bought this and put bigger wings on to go even higher than the U2. And NASA still use that to date. And it's outdated, or out, its um, uh, flights uh, actually have gone longer than the U2. Good Canberra. Anyway. So infranodal conduction delay, the most common that we look at is left bundle branch block. We have got a nice indication in the UK for with right bundle branch block for CRT. Uh, but what we really want to see, we want to see a juicy left bundle branch block. And we get then will get associated with that intraventricular dyssynchrony, as we've mentioned. Now we know that right ventricular pacing is bad. And this, the top one is looking at the David trial. And this was looking at in ICDs using either a DDDR or a VVI uh, pacing. And what we found surprising at the time, but now in retrospect, it makes sense, was that with increased RV pacing associated with DDDR pacing, uh, there was an increased uh, episodes of death, first hospitalization for heart failure uh, and death of any cause. So RV pacing is bad. And we also know from most study where as you increase the RV 
pacing percentage between 0 and 40 percent, at which point it then becomes irrelevant, there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation and heart failure. So if you've got someone you're pacing at 40 percent, you might as well pace 100 percent because it isn't going to make any further change in their risk of atrial fibrillation or um, heart failure. But if you go down from 40 to 30 percent, that significantly reduces their risk of AF and heart failure. So left ventricular pacing, this is what we're interested in. We want to get into that coronary sinus and then hopefully get somewhere into the left posterior wall to pace and improve function. And the acute effects um, of uh, left ventricular and biventricular pacing are actually similar. So when we look at the delta change in aortic pulse pressure, or the max left ventricular DP by DT, which is another measure of cardiac contractility, both of them similarly improved um, across any AV delay, um, the uh, aortic pulse pressure or the max LV, uh, DP by DT. Um, and that, as I say, left ventricular only or biventricular pacing, but RV pacing is significantly worse. What about the LVRV offset? Well, most of the original studies use simultaneous stimulation. Uh, there are groups of people we're going to find who prefer left ventricular pre-excitation and others who prefer right ventricular. Um, there isn't an overall um, uh, standard setting for, for everyone. So this is a suck it and see element, really. Hey, uh, Dr. Yeah. Question for you there. So uh, there's been like a lot of the the research I've read is that a narrow QRS is associated with better outcomes and kind of what you, you've said here. Um, so when you have LV first activation and you kind of have that isoelectric portion of that QRS where it doesn't look like you're actually activating something, but you probably are, yeah. you would count the QRS from the initial pulse, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, it's not from the, yeah, because you, exactly you said, you end up in the situation where you're going, oh, I haven't actually started my QRS. You have started your QRS. You may not see what you uh, that. And, and that's what when we get, when we look at uh, these patients, we're actually measuring contractility instantaneously, when you're, especially when you're looking at DP by DT. Um, and um, that, it, we, we, we've shown that in multiple, both animal and human studies in the initial part, that there are groups of people within three beats you will have an improvement um, and it's not automatically associated with the change in the QRS. So uh, we will end up with a group of people where we can improve their DP by DT and it's not the same as reducing the QRS. Having said that, there is a degree of correlation, but it's not perfect. And, and so you end up having to take it individually. Now we can't invasively measure DP by DT, doing it by echo is not great. Um, uh, and the ECG is a good initial assessment. Does that make sense, AJ? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've always kind of wondered that because I think people will cheat and say, oh, you know, our QRS starts here. Like, yeah, well, the first phase is actually the induction. Absolutely. Thank you well, for that. Because you've got, you know that you've got, uh, you have uh, paced the, the, the left foot, you know you've paced the heart. The fact that you cannot see that initial phase is irrelevant. Very good question, Andy. Yeah. Really, really quickly. So yeah. on your ECG, so yeah. um, I'm assuming the best model for biventricular um, pacing on the 12 lead ECG V1 and lead, I'm sorry, V1 and lead one. Normally you yeah. want, obviously, um, <clears throat> you want negative in lead one and you want like a right bundle, narrow complex right bundle in V1. Is that right? Well, I mean, what you get in V1 is a composite, isn't it, really? Yeah. So you've got your left bundle, which comes from LV only pace, um, uh, from RV only pacing. You get a dominant R with V1. You end up with a composite. I don't care What's what it? the shape is. Because so that, the shape that was my question. That, where you are pacing. Yeah, I'm not interested in the shape. So okay. I am interested in the QS duration, but okay. not the shape. So if you've got a dominant R wave in V1, that is fine. Uh, what we're interested in is what is what the, the cure restoration across the board is. Brilliant. That was my question. Yeah. Excellent. Right. One thing that does really matter, and this has been perfectly demonstrated, is sight matters. So this is looking at pulse pressure and again, DP by DT. And there is a sweet spot perfectly in the middle. You want to be in the mid lateral position. And that's why 
often when I paste in the CRT and and the technician said, OK, do you want to use three and four? Well, actually, we know from all of the studies originally that mid lateral position is the important bit. So I will say, OK, yeah, we can use any of them. But if there's if it's all all things are equal, I want the one which is in that mid lateral position. And we'll look at the examples on the venograms in a bit. So what are the effects of CRT both chronically and acutely? Well, if we look at the DP by DT, we can see that within almost instantaneously, there's, there can be this improvement in this on the left hand slide going from 500 to 800. And then there's still a further persistent improvement up until three months and then it stabilizes. And if you turn off the pacing, there will be an immediate reduction in that DP by DT. Not quite down to baseline, but there will be. On the flip side, if you look at their end diastolic volumes, then there is a gradual reduction. You turn off the pacing and there is no change. And there's a gradual remodeling back to the original baseline. So we've got two elements. You've got one element, which is acute hemodynamics, and another element, which is chronic reverse remodeling. And uh, that's why you get some people who are super responders in the initial phase, and you get another group of people who don't respond really for a few months until their volumes have reduced. And there are plenty of studies looking at all different parameters that I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of those. Now, this is an important one, and this is that it, it the CRT improves, but actually also improves your oxygen uptake. Now, if you compare the same group of people who either have use of dobutamine to improve their DP by DT or LV pacing, both of them improve the DP by DT by the same amount. The difference is dobutamine increases your oxygen requirement, whereas actually LV pacing reduces your oxygen requirement. And that could lead to some of the mortality benefit because you are reducing their oxygen requirement at an intracellular level. Uh, and so that can lead to a reduction in terms of ventricular arrhythmias. Mortality, um, we, we know that actually the two of the biggest, uh, the original trials, Companion, which looked at both CRTPs and CRTDs, looked at a composite endpoint of death and hospitalization as the primary endpoint, and then death as a secondary. And what we found that was the, uh, with the CRT, that there was a, um, uh, an improvement in terms of the primary endpoint. And when we look at the secondary of mortality, there was a trend with CRT. Uh, but didn't uh, quite reach statistical significance, P was 0.06, but a CRTT definitely did reach statistically significant improvement. And when we look at the CARE HF, which is uh, randomized to see a one-to-one -one with medical and medical plus CRT, we saw a similar thing, the composite reduction to th were from 55 to 39%, but we did in this group see a benefit from 30 to 20% in terms of uh, mortality, and that was over about a four-year study. So CRT does reduce mortality, not massively. And when we look at the numbers needed to treat to save a life, then we are in the order with a CRT in companion of 25 or a CRTD of 14 patients. And when we compare that to primary prevention ICD studies, such as MADAT and MADAT-1, it's significantly higher. But when we're looking at all these other studies, so for example, CIBIS-2 and MERIT-HF, which are looking at beta blockers in heart failure, they're actually, the numbers needed to treat are less. Uh, than those very important trials. And we think it's very important we get a beta blocker on. Well, great, but actually getting that CRT is probably more important. That is one of the most beautiful aircraft in the world. That's a Victor KC-1 tanker. Uh, it's a beautiful aircraft and the noise is phenomenal. Very low when you see it, it's got a very short undercarriage. It's, it's a beast. Looks like the Nimrod, doesn't it? A bit. It's not, no, no. When you put that next to Nimrod, nah. This is hunkered down. Come on, if you think you're hard enough type stuff. So this is what we want to do. We want to convert this left-hand slide. Uh, apologies, stolen from Medtronic, but hey-o. Uh, and then we want to get that desynchronous left ventricle into this to improve the DP by DT and in the long term to reduce volumes. I'm not going to mention that one, actually, because it's not valid anymore. Narrow QRS, the studies show it doesn't work. Don't do it. And that is a beautiful photo. I took this. This is the uh, this is um, Princess Mary's Hospital in Akrotiri in Cyprus. This was during the Second Gulf War. This was a guy's final trip in an F3 tornado. And uh, I, we did some close formation. I can nearly see the camera make on his uh, on his camera over there. So this is what we really want to see. This is 
give me a CRT. We've got a broad left bundle, nearly 200 milliseconds. We've got a first degree heart block, PR is about 240 milliseconds. It says, give me a left ventricular lead. So what do we do? And these are from my time in Oxford. So we're going to make our pocket right down to the prepectoral fascia, get under that prepectoral fascia because that gives you the tightest pocket afterwards. And then we're going to do, as we have saw in when I was with uh, Dr. Daffer, use an extra thoracic subclavian puncture. Um, it is, you could say it's an auxiliary vein. It's actually, pro technically, depending where you are in the, on the rib space, it's probably a subclavian, but it, you're in the vein before the subclavius muscle. Catheter wise, um, you know, there's multiple different ones. I tend to prefer as my first shot, this extended hook shape. Uh, this is actually a St. Jude one, but I, I generally use the Boston one. Uh, the deflectable catheter from Medtronic is quite useful, but it's expensive for what it is. You don't need it. Uh, and generally we can get away with uh, an extended hook. I, I use that 98, 99% of cases, mm -hmm. sometimes a more of a sing, simple hook. So if you get rid of that, the black bit there, just that sort of shape will do for small hearts. So here we have, so here we've got someone, we've got the RV lead in, we're in LEO looking and we get a venogram and we can see we've, we've got in with our balloon and we've got this nice postural lateral branch. There's more of an anterior one and we've got a middle vein down here as well. And here in our REO, we can actually now see uh, there's quite a tortuous tortuosity on here going into this branch. Um, and I think if we go to the end, we will see now this middle vein actually now comes round underneath and actually uh, marries up with the tributaries over here into the anterior and that lateral vein. And what we did, we actually tried to get in here and we were able to get a inner 90 catheter to get into here. We could get down here. Unfortunately, Mr. Phrenic Nerve lived all the way along there and we were unable to pace that. So we actually ended up going down underneath to the bottom uh, and actually we got a good uh, separation. Uh, and if we can see here in the LEO view, we want to be in that mid position. It's a little bit on the low side, but that's not bad. And we've got a lot of separation over here. So we wanted to be in the mid third, which we're just about there. And we want to be in that lateral position over here. So it's not a bad position considering uh, what we had to play with. Unfortunately, CS dissections occur. So here we have one. So we've now got this large dissection. It's compressing the vein, the coronary sinus up here. Uh, and this was caused by a, uh, a JR4 catheter. Uh, using a JR4, I, I love JR4 catheter, it's my favorite weapon, uh, but it, you, it is a rigid tip. You have to be careful with it. Uh, when you're advancing it, you generally wanna have your 3.5 guide wire or a small little guide wire on it. Um, but if you do get a dissection, generally you can just sit and wait it out, sit on your hands, listen to music, and then things can settle. But in this case, it didn't. And we really wanted to see what was going on. It's compressing this. We didn't really just wanted to abandon things there. So in this case, what we did, we then wired up into the true lumen of the, the main coronary sinus. We then put a balloon up and dragged it back all the way across to reoppose that dissection flap. And already we can see we've got a little bit of blood in there. Um, and we were able then to actually see, we've now got some flow into this vessel. Um, and then we did uh, try again, I think we could get in there. Ultimately, we found the phrenic nerve. So even though we wanted to be in there, we end up having to go uh, through the middle vein to the bottom. But in terms of the dissection, um, you can use a balloon and drag it back as long as you're 100% confident you are in the main coronary sinus and not in the dissection flap. If you do that with a balloon, you that's game over for the day. You're going to have to leave it and then come back a different day because that isn't going to reoppose in a short period. A small dissection flap with a balloon, it will work. And what we want to do is to see this converted into this. And this is one of the, I mean, this is one of my ones from JR. You, we've got the two bits. You can see an improvement in synchrony. And what you can really see is a reduction in the end diastolic volume. And this is a super responder who ended up with ejection fraction of 54%. Um, that's what we want. Unfortunately, we don't get that all the time. But when you do, it reminds you that this is a good therapy. And when things are going wrong, it's difficult to get in the coronary sinus. It's this that keeps you going and stops you going to dermatology because this is what makes the difference. 
What about learning curve? Well, th there is. And, um, you know, when you're looking at your times, we're looking really about the three hour mark as an average for your first five. But you gradually get down under the three hour mark as an average and you need next 11. And that keeps on going down and, and getting times of 90 minutes for a CRT is entirely feasible. Um, but you just need to, 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 to work on it. And it, it does take time to get those times in the lab down. In terms of device complications, unsuccessful is quoted at up to 10%. I think nowadays it's less than that. Um, this is a slightly old InSync 3 attain. Um, and the issue generally is the left ventricle leave. Corey sinus can either be an issue in terms of you just can't get in because of valves. And if that does happen, then putting a, uh, I find if you've got a valve in the middle of that Corey sinus, the best thing is to try and get a wire across it and then taking either an inner 90 or a JR4 and then peeling around to open that valve to get your JR4 or your inner 90 across and then get your main CS across. Infection, 30-day uh, mortality. That 30-day mortality actually is similar to those with severe heart failure. So the 30-day mortality from CRT is no different from the baseline of having severe heart failure. Uh, if you go back to the QRS of 200 milliseconds, I've got a 40% one-year mortality. And, and the procedural death, I, I mean, it, it is uncommon nowadays. Kind of problems, well, the big ones, phrenic nerve stimulation, it's still a pain. We do have some options with doing transvenous, uh, sorry, transeptal punctures, et cetera. A uh, 30% non-responder rate, it's still there, unfortunately. Uh, but the big ones are making sure we identify our patients because we're not treating all of them. And we know that it's a big benefit um, to do that. So hopefully we're saying that CRP, it improves lots of things acutely um, and non-responder is still a problem, but the ECG still remains our basic tool. Um, and, and hopefully that's give you some examples of, of, of things that can go wrong, including with me. Any questions? <clears throat> uh, so I was going to ask a quick question, JT. Yeah. So the, the non-responders that you were referring to, do you think um, such group of patients could benefit from left bundle pacing? Or is there a case to be made for? You're asking the wrong person there. <laughs> you know I'm not a big fan. <laughs> I, 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 no. I'm still not convinced of that yet. Um, right. it, it's getting there. The one thing I do know, I think LV only pacing is a, um, is a, uh, and we've demonstrated acutely that um, uh, LV only pacing in some people significantly improves DPBIT uh, compared to BIV pacing. So I personally would go for, a, have a trial of LV only pacing if you've got that option. Um, and you haven't got any concerns of LV only pacing in terms of underlying complete heart block, for example, and stuff like that. So uh, that would be my preferred option. Optimizing, you know, you, the echo, um, the, the multi-center trials looking at echo optimization showed it don't work. So you can do it. And I'm sure on an individual case basis, there are people who do it, but as a group, it doesn't work. Thank you. AJ? Yeah, uh, no, these are, that's a really good presentation. I, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I want to get your opinion. Uh, you kind of talked about CS access, but um, would you mind just talking about your process in general? You reference using an extended hook, using a JR4, but yeah. uh, just so people can understand your your toolkit. And your, yeah, your... let me just go. I, I don't. I have a very small toolkit, um, and uh, as I say, I generally I will. I'm just going backwards to just to go to the, the pictures. But generally, an extended hook shape, a large hook with two curves is because the majority of the Cori sinus will not be linearly related to going across they will be uh, pointing up and so having something which does have a, a, a nose that points up and um, I believe is, is is beneficial it also means once you, the other way of getting into it is if you end up with a catheter in the right ventricle and then torque it so it back uh, counterclockwise so it's pointing uh, to the septum when you pop out of the tricuspid valve it may pop into the cori sinus but you need a double curve for that to occur if you've only got a single curve such as 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 one of these ones then it's essentially straight it won't do that for you and the jr4 i use that i put the if i i, I literally do a minute with the extended hook on its own and a wire and a bit of puff contrast. If it doesn't go in immediately, then I'm going straight for the JR4. I take the JR, the, the CS catheter, I will stick that in the middle of the right atrium and then use the JR4 to hunt around 
for the Corrie Sinus. And sometimes it's not where you think it's going to be. You can sit there hunting in a region going, I'm sure it's going to be up here. I'm sure it's right here. And you end up with a coronary sinus right on the floor of the right atrium. And it happens. Um, so if, if you're banging along and you're sure you look in the right place, you probably aren't. Because if you were in the right place, you'd have found it. So it's at that point, just reevaluate and go, OK, I'm going to look somewhere else where it may not be expected, either really high or really low. And they do happen. Fantastic. And then for wires, you, you reference wire. Do you have a wire preference yeah. if you had? Uh, I'm, I'm old fashioned, so I stick with a 3.5 steel guide wire just to get into the CS. It's not going to do any damage as long as you've got a, 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 a curve on it. And, and you know, in, if you've got something you can't get across a valve, I may convert to a Terumo to go across that. I prefer using a Terumo rather than an angioplasty guide wire just because of the extra stability it's got. Uh, but 99% mm. of the time, you can still do it with a 3.5 guide wire because it's about getting your, once you've got the wire across, it's getting that nose of, a, of an angled catheter to peel that valve, that sort of, if you imagine a, a half moon, it's peeling that valve open such that you can then get your catheter in. All right. Brilliant. We've got a question here, JT, from, from, from the chat group. It says, yeah. Sir, please, what are the issues with right ventricular pacing? And if the 30 day mortality for severe heart failure is the same as those with CRT, any need for CRT or is it a few percent percentage of patients? Or yeah, percentage I mean, that, the, the CRT mortality is so, is is. The mortality in patients who had a CRT, whether they got it successfully or not, was actually similar to the baseline underlying risk of death. So if you have someone who's got a cure restoration of 200 millis 220 milliseconds, you're looking at a 40 percent mortality in 12 months. Okay. Worst case scenario. So if you then take that, divide that by 12, that gives you a one month mortality of up to three, two and a half, three percent. And, and these studies in CRT had to report the deaths within 30 days of the implant. So was that the cause of death? probably not but they have to report it as such and we have to accept that that crt that death occurred within 30 days of a crt would that a death have occurred anyway probably would okay i think you've answered oh. the follow up to that yeah yeah the, the right the the rv pacing i think you know, i was asking about that as well i think you kind of touched on it um but yeah, if you want so, to kind of read yeah so rv apical pacing is bad um, you know, if we're looking at his bundle pacing, etc., cetera, you, you, you can try his bundle pacing, you can perforate and tamponade the Medtronic catheter for doing it. They got up to a 10% um, tamponade rate um, when they're using their four French catheter for that. So you've just got to be careful with, with new technologies and making sure, even though something may not be perfect, something you're trying to see if better may not actually give you the, what you want. You know, our death rate from RV pacing is, is nigh on zero, but chronic RV apical pacing may lead to, in a small group of people, to worsening heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So, yeah, we, we should be avoiding RV pacing, but at the moment we don't have a true perfect technology um, that will give us a much better uh, procedure without new complications, because we don't tamponade in RV pacing, really. Uh, if you do it gently, it doesn't happen. But if you're going to go his pace, then you can do. I, I think that's an important distinction, too, is that RV pacing is better than no pacing if the patient Absolutely. is dependent on a device. But it still can lead to exacerbating heart failure. So if, if that's your only solution, then use the solution you have. But if you do have, you know, LV delivery options. Absolutely. And I think that that comes into making a decision. And we're not really touched on this because it wasn't in this, in, the, in this talk, but, you know, looking at LV uh prophylactic pacing for people with a degree of impairment who then need 100 percent pacing so if you have got someone who's got an ejection fraction of 40 percent they're going to complete heart block and they need rv pacing it's going to make things worse given the lv lead but that's a, di that's a different talk yeah quick scenario um that i've obviously come across in clinic so there was a patient who had a profound av block um um, wasn't pacing, it was a, a, a pacing, but um, the AV conduction was about 320 milliseconds. Yeah. Um, it, it was V-sense. Um, so they've been like that for a while. And then they started getting a little bit symptomatic with breathlessness and things. So um, there was a, so I was arguing that basically this patient needs v, RV pacing, basically, essentially. Um, just to narrow the AV delay, you know, AP's, V pacing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there so, are groups of people where that AV 
as, as we showed on that, that chart, you, yeah. you know, you've got to get a really long AV delay to truly get into the area where you're causing true hemodynamic compromise. Compromise. Um, yeah. So that's not to say that some people aren't sensitive. And that, 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 you know, that just goes down to having to look at those on a case by case basis, really. Um, and, and, they, and they may feel better. You know, there yeah. are people who you can um, change an AV delay, turn around um, and go, what have you done? Because I feel better. And you're going, I've only changed it by 40 milliseconds. And then suddenly you're feeling better. And you can tell me that. I mean, that's, you know, there are people like that. So in, in that scenario, if the patient has got LV dysfunction, or would you, would you, would you consider pacing your RV if they've got, they've only got good LV function? Or would you, would you no, have? Like, not if you've got, no, I wouldn't do that. So if you've got someone who's got ejection fraction of 50%, I'm not putting an LV lead in. Okay. No, no, I meant, I meant for the RV pacing, you know, some, this is RV, we're talking about RV apical pacing. And, yeah. and um, for somebody who, LV is, yeah. So if they've got like a, a, a poor LV function, would you consider shortening the AV delay and just pacing your RV, whereas, whereas previously, they were not RV pacing. Would you? Would you? Well, I'd much rather put help the their symptoms. I'd much rather put the LV lead in. Okay. 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 You know, if you've got somebody who's got severely impaired LV function with RV pacing, put the LV lead in because we know we can improve their LV function. You can take someone who's got an ejection fraction of forty percent, drops down to twenty percent with RV pacing, and then you can improve that up to forty percent, and never even into an ICD category. Okay. Uh, so, especially in the elderly. Uh, that's what you want to be doing. You want to be avoiding, you know, I don't want to stick an ICD lead as an extra lead into an 85 year old unnecessarily. Um, so yeah, I, I've got no problems with sticking an LV lead into anyone, any age group, but as long as you've got a good indication and that one would sound like it. Yeah, okay, brilliant. I, I, uh, I think this is a question that, that we've discussed before, um, JT, is that, you know, is it a long AV delay with no pacing or a short AV delay with some pacing. And I think you've kind of said avoid RV pacing if possible, if I remember correct, because there's kind of a yeah, debate on that. Yeah, I mean, th th and that's because that percentage makes a difference if it's under 40%. So, you mm. know, if you go from 40 to 30%, your, your absolute reduction of AF and hospitalization is around two or 3% per annum. So, you know, it's a significant event, but you then end up having to play off patient symptomatology you know, it's mortality at AF and heart failure risk versus symptoms. And, and they may feel so much better with that shortened AV delay, which does increase their pacing. And then you just have to take it on the chin uh, and go, yeah, I, it's not what I would like in terms of the RV pacing percentage, but they feel so much better that that's worth it. And that's where you just have to weigh one against the other. Right, there's a, there's a question here from um, the same person in the chat group. So it says, Sir, sir what, what could suggest a patient may be a poor responder to ask CRT? Um, and I can't see... Well, that. there are, I mean, there are MRI studies showing that the scar doesn't pace. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of these people in the UK, we will have an MRI scan. And if you see that lateral wall is completely toasted uh, with complete transmural infarct, it, it, it may suggest that you're not, it's not going to work. Having said that, I don't think I would... I, if I, unless it was completely gone, I'd still have a go. You know, if you made that decision, just because it is infarcted, uh, I, I, I'd still give it a go because there'll be a small group where actually the MRI doesn't give us exact data and there may be enough that we can conduct and I would do it. Brilliant. So like, as, long, as long as they're within indication for it, right? Or if they're going to be 100% pacing, it's, there's an argument, Absolutely. I would say. As long as there's a standard, either prophylactic or a standard secondary, you know, because of the ECG uh, that we do it, then yes, I, I, I'd give the MRI would not stop me doing it. Yeah, I, I think one thing you, you touched on, um, anodal stem. So just for the rest of the group, um, it's important to know that like anodal stem can occur, but you can work around it by bumping up to voltage. By example, with you can lower your voltage and have a decent margin of capture threshold to destem threshold. Sometimes you'll be in trouble where you're going to get diaphragmatic stem. No matter what, you're going to activate that nerve, and the patient will have like a hiccuping-like symptom repeatedly, which is obviously not something that is good for their quality of life. Um, but just to keep that in mind is that there's always options, there's always programming. You don't have to necessarily, you know, find a different lead placement. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Templey, on that. 
but sometimes you can just work around it if say the sim threshold five the capture yeah. threshold is two at one point five it's viable and, and this is where having it's really too good to record the twelve lead ECG uh, during those 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 swings where it changes from anodal to without so you can end up with four different ECGs uh, but uh, but if you don't know that from the baseline then it's difficult to be sure just from the ECG so if that does happen, it's important to get that recorded, that 12 lead, and get it stuck in the patient's notes. So in the future, you can look at it, and you know, when thresholds do change, and odal stimulation threshold changes, then you know where you are. Awesome. Dr. Daffy, have you got any questions? Yeah, few, very few questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tintley, for the excellent and uh, very great lecture. I want to ask a few questions. One is, um, if you have a patient uh, 60 years old and um, he had ejection fraction uh, 20%, uh, dilated uh, ventricles, and the QRS complex are narrow, but also have a complete heart block, uh, will, you, uh, will you agree that we should go for a CRT for such a case? Uh, yes, I would. And that's because. Now, you could make a case be, um, because you are going to pace 100% of the time. Uh, now, if they've yes. got a left bundle branch block, there is a difference in terms of what happens. So if you have a left bundle branch block and then you pace the left ventricle, RV pacing is still worse than native LV uh, left bundle branch block. Uh, but yeah. the significant there is a significant difference between that delta with an um, underlying narrow complex when you will significantly make things worse. So in that case, absolutely, I put an LV lead in. Good. Uh, then my second question is on uh, the mid lateral position. Yeah, is the best uh, position to uh, slit in the LV lead. But in case uh, some uh, you do the corona, you do the uh, CS uh, uh, venogram, you could not get a very good. Uh, uh, mid lateral position, which other position do you recommend? That is one. The two, uh, if you are entering into. Uh, I'll come back to your second question. I, I can't keep two questions in my head. So, um, yes. so to answer that one, I'm going to go show you the delta. So, going into the apex, 30, but you can still get in the apex um, uh, 18%. So you're getting a significant improvement, but just not as good. So you shouldn't write off the apex. The base is a different kettle of fish. You've got two issues when you start looking at more basal segments. One is um, uh, looking at the improvements of DP by DT. The second issue is stability. Uh, and you need yeah. to get enough lead in there to keep it stable. So I would tend to go towards the apex because there is still an improvement of DP by DT uh, rather than going to a basal position. And whether that's, mm. and, and the same is true when you're going more anteriorly or more um, inferiorly, you still get an improvement in the mid position, whether it's a bit too anterior or a bit too inferior, but it's just mm. not as good in that sweet spot. Okay. Then the second question is, um, as, uh, when, uh, when you are navigating into the, uh, into the middle cardiac vein, what are some of the techniques that you use, sir? Because I know you demonstrated uh, uh, some of those techniques when you were with us in Nigeria a few, uh, few weeks back. Yeah. Did, did you get the question, sir? Speaking of Instagram, uh, you need to be making... We, I think we've lost you, JT. Yes, we lost him. Mm. Maybe because you know he's driving. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that will affect the network. Then while we are waiting for him, um, AJ and Julius. Uh, you know, there is a way you do the setting of, there is a way you do the setting, or you can set the timing to shorten the uh, the interval and also narrow the QRS complex uh, while programming the device. What are those tips all about? 
I know you did it for the cobalt. Uh, AJ also did it uh, for some of the um, Abbott uh, implant devices we did. Uh, uh, Jules, I can take the first part if you want. Yeah, sure, go for it. Yeah, yeah so you're looking yeah, at a, at a number at of a... Uh, when you're trying to optimize uh, LV finishing. So um, one of the things you're looking at is your LV RV offset timing, which is what Dr. Templey briefly spoke on as saying, um, are we doing simultaneous pacing or are we doing some LV activation early? You rarely will have RV first pacing. Um, you may have it in some patients with like a right bundle branch block, but typically that's not a strong indication for a CRT to begin with. So you're unlikely to even have that. Um, so your LV RV offset is one of the things you're looking to optimize. Um, you're looking to optimize your site of um, pacing as well, so your site of activation. Um, there's opportunities to multi-point pace, which if you look at those uh, leads, the new modern quadrupolar leads, you have four electrodes to choose from, and you could choose to pace from usually the site of latest activation. Um, so typically the site of later electrical activation, and then 30 millimeter spacing away from that. Um, has been shown to have better outcomes than a shorter spacing, so a better anatomical physical space between those electrodes. So typically you'll find the site that is activated later um, in the electrical chain, which means there's more electrical dyssynchrony. Paste from there, and then you'll have your, if you do it, uh, multi-point pacing at a 30 millimeter or greater spacing um, to activate there. So LVR, uh, site of latest activation, um, site of um, multi-point pacing, so separation, and then finally your AV delay. So a lot of these um, devices have modern, like the modern devices have um, automated AV delay algorithms like Sync AV or Adapt A in, in Medtronic, where it will measure the intrinsic conduction system and then um, subtract a delta from that and then pace accordingly. So you get What's uh, the idea is like a triple fusion or at least a, a dual fusion of the intrinsic coming across your LV pace and your RV pace all activating um, as much tissue as possible. Um, and that can result in the narrowest QRS. There isn't a uh, study, I believe, that has direct data on that, but Truco et al., um, I can find the study data for you, has come up with basically narrow QRS or fusion optimized intervals are associated with better outcomes. So a algorithm focused on narrowing a QRS would have a, a, a better outcome overall is the idea yeah. through the trans property. Sorry, Jules, go on, yes, I, I kind of ran over you. Sorry, no, no, I think you've answered everything. I mean, the only difference between Medtronic and, and your one, uh, Medtronic um, have got the algorithm called Adaptive by VLV, and, and it gives you an option for good AV, anyone who's good, um, Good, good AV conduction. You can certainly go with a bi, um, adaptive by V, um, LV. The, the LV works. Um, it's, 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 I mean, there's been studies that have shown by Medtronic that shows that LV pacing only is is good for the patient on on two counts. Um, the first one it gives battery longevity because you you only pacing the LV. Um, yeah. And the other one, obviously, um, um, that there's good outcome CRT responder from that. So I know other people argue against that, that like they prefer the by V pacing fully. Um, and there's an algorithm that uses that only um, it uses to pace the LV that it works out like 70% of the AV conduction, um, you know, the normal physiologic AV conduction. So it paces the LV 70% of that um, timing interval. Um, so it pre-paces the LV, so you, um, like calculating that the right ventricular um, bundle will electrify the right, um, the right bundle will electrify the right ventricle roughly about the same time. So it paces around about 70% of the timing of the LV, of the AV delay, and, and it paces LV only, uses the, so it, it is by V, but one half is natural conduction, the other one obviously is um, LV pacing. So the algorithm yeah. to think about, but I'm going to say, so I've got JT on the phone. Um, who's Good. going to, um, so he heard everything we said, but he's, I'm just going to hold the phone to, so you can answer that the latter part of your question. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Go ahead. There you go, JT. Okay. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me. Um, so it was like a Dr. Adapi's question about the middle uh, uh, cardiac vein. 
So in order to get into that, firstly is getting the venogram done. So making sure you do a long enough venogram so you can see the tributaries from the anterior vein, feeding the middle vein so you can see where it is, and you can see the os of the middle vein. You need to know that for getting in. Secondly, uh, the easiest technique for getting in there is to take an inner 90 catheter because 99% of the time the middle vein is pointing straight down the screen and have it poking out of your main coronary sinus catheter and then pull, not by much, by about half an inch, so at least it can turn uh, uh, inferiorly. Drag the main CS down and then rotate the inner catheter 180 degrees so it's pointing downwards. Drag back until the inner 90 engages the os. You usually see it as a drop. And once you've done that, wire with a 3 5 guide wire or a tarumo if you prefer the inner catheter. And then advance that inner catheter, and usually by rotating it another 180 degrees, you'll get round that first corner, and usually you can get that inner catheter as far as you want into the middle vein. But what you really want to be doing is not being in the middle vein, you want to be getting into the tributaries, feeding into the lateral vein, so you can work your way round posterolaterally in the heart. Great. Very important, yes. <laughs> Work clear. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tim Lee. You're welcome. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> the end of what you uh, I was talking about, the algorithm, is that if the patient's even you know, uh, is quite narrow, um, AV conduction is quite um, small, then what you could do is actually put it to non-adaptive. Dr. Laffey, put it to for metronic yes. non-adaptive and actually decide on what the, um, the AV interval is make it shorter that way you won't get maybe competition and if they're getting a lot of um v sense coming through when you look at the rate histogram and you get a lot of v sense like if you look at the far end the higher rates um it might be worth basically putting it to non-adaptive and and shorting the av delay more so that there's you know it paces as much as possible when you, when you get interruptions of the crt so that's another one to bear in mind and that okay. but, People with normal AV conduction, you can certainly buy V, adaptive by V, LV, certainly is good. Um, but everything AJ said, like pretty much he covered the whole lot. So it's exactly sure. the same, sure. but slightly different sure. algorithms. It's got multi point pacing as well. Um, it's all relevant. And that's it. Very good. Okay, nice. Uh, maybe ask any other any question. more questions. Maybe, maybe, uh... Sorry, AJ. We've oh, I was saying, Julius AVs, do you prefer 140-110? Yeah, Typically spot for on. fixed AV delay for non-adaptive? Spot, um, spot on, yeah, spot on. Um, yeah, so, you, 140, yeah, it seems to be a nominal settings for a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, so 140 um, milliseconds for your pace, pace AV delay, 110 for your sense AV delay. Um, something yeah. to keep in mind with the group is that when you're sensing, you're seeing the activation late, right? Because if you're if your lead is sitting in the RV and it is sensing the activity in the RV, it's already worked its way through the chain to get to that lead. So anytime you're having a sense AV delay or anytime you're trying to fuse with an intrinsic conduction, you have to remember that you're not seeing the instantaneous, you know, um, electrification of the heart. You're seeing a delayed wherever you're sensing from. So you're always going to have a shorter sense AV delay. You're always going to subtract the delta from your dynamic AV algorithm to pace a little early because you're trying to fuse with something that's already occurring. Excellent. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, sometimes we do um, 120 pace and then 90, 90 sensed. Um, but obviously, like you said, normally between 140 and 110 uh, milliseconds for cents. You can change it, yeah, between that. Um, a lot of other hospitals have got different protocols that they go by. Um, and that, But yeah, that, that's right. That's right, AJ. Spot on. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. So any, any more questions, anyone? Um, Dr. Ola, Ola did you measure because I know you're you're learning your um, CRT. You're, I'm sure you've got questions. <laughs> no, 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 really. It has been fantastic lectures. Okay, I just appreciate the great teachings. So with these teachings, what we now do at our site is to now go back and read and reread. 
So anytime <laughs> I questions, usually post it to AJ and then he tries to demystify the questions. Excellent. So, Excellent. <laughs> so. Brilliant. Brilliant. So. Any, anyone else? If not, I'll just sign um, JT. Well, that, that, was, that was really fantastic. That was excellent. Um, re really, really um, um, enjoy that. So that was really good. Thank you for that. Um, so we'll, we'll let you go for you to focus on the rest of your driving. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll see you at some point this week at work. <laughs> excellent. That's even good. Yeah, very great teacher. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So if All we right. can get to uh, uh, Dr. Doctor Mrs. Apana. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, because that uh, LBP area pacing has been waiting for weeks to months now. So if we can get to her, if we can, if she agreed to take her uh, lecture next week, then we can take it next week. What do you think, AJ and Julius? Main. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, AJ. You go yeah, ahead. Go ahead, so AJ. If all, if all feels, oh, I, I was just saying. Um, I think uh, Zane is always waiting in the wings to do one as well. So we can always have two yeah. discussions because Left Bundle is very new to the region. Obviously, it's new to the world. To be honest, it's only a couple of years old. So I think having as many yes, different, sir. you know, uh, perspectives on this is important. So if he's available, that would be amazing, and then we can do a follow up one with. Uh, Dr. Sharif, Zane Sharif as well. Beautiful. Fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. And I know Dr. Shaman speaking to him um, just last week. He was really keen on it because he's interested in bringing it to Northampton. So I did I did ask him to come on. So he's, he, he will come on next week if it is coming on. Good. Um, good, yeah. good, good, good. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>